This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of February 28th, 2021. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 175. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition, headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest. The Is It Just Me commentary. I award a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker. And the big deal feature. Nearly a year since the coronavirus pandemic was officially declared, and the religious community is starting to lose faith in government. But do British Columbians want to open up before they get the vaccine? Hear religious leaders complain to Premier John Horgan and Dr. Bonnie Henry, and hear Mario Canseco of Research Co. on his latest poll. Now, is it just me? Is it just me, or did Friday's announcement that the NDP government will carry on with Site C all you need to know about why there was a snap election last fall? Imagine if Premier John Horgan had stuck to the legislated October 2021 voting day. You bet the BC Liberals and Greens would have feasted on the cost overruns and done their best to split the pro and anti Site C factions inside the NDP. Horgan spent half a million dollars on a report by Peter Milburn, who heads BC's public sector pension fund. Only a summary version was released. Horgan and Energy Minister Bruce Ralston said at the news conference that it should go ahead because it's half-built and it would cost $10 billion to mothball. Was it by design or by coincidence? They chose to announce the bad news on the only Take Out the Trash Friday that coincided with the 10th anniversary of Christy Clark becoming BC Premier at her own party's convention. The public deserves to know more about this project. BC Hydro will not show ratepayers exactly how every dollar is spent. Believe me, I've asked. So how did this go from $8.3 billion to $10.7 billion to $16 billion in just seven years? How much waste and corruption are hidden at Hydro headquarters and by the banks of the Peace River? Just to put it into context, the $16 billion price tag is twice the all-in cost for Vancouver's 2010 Olympics. Listen to this clip of the Narwhal's Sarah Cox asking Minister Ralston some important questions. So we have a situation where the BCUC has been um, asking for uh, overdue Site C quarterly reports from BC Hydro for some time now, and that's been a bit of a theme. Will the government uh, restore the full oversight function of the BCUC with regard to the Site C project? Thanks very much. Uh, I've uh, asked uh, BC Hydro to uh, bring the quarterly reports and the annual report up to date. Uh, they, they have uh, fallen behind. There was also uh, a series of questions that BCUC posed to BC Hydro. I've asked uh, BC Hydro to, uh, to answer those questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Allen, who is taking over uh, as the chair of the board, is, is aware of my views. Sarah, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. Um, as, as we know, there are a few other large hydro dams in the country that are seriously over budget. The Muskrat Falls Dam in Labrador, the Kiaf Dam in northern Manitoba. In both cases, there has been an inquiry. In the case of the Muskrat Falls Dam, a public inquiry. Um, there have been calls for a public inquiry into Site C to look at what went wrong, when and how. Uh, has the government considered uh, a full inquiry with testimony under oath to look at what has gone wrong with this project? Uh, no, we haven't. What do you think? Email Bob at thebreaker.news. News podcast for Around the Rim. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Rim. In Apple Daily, Hong Kong starts mass vaccination program as crowds flock for COVID jabs. Currently, only vaccines produced by China's Sinovac are available since the first shipment of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine was delayed. The 70,000 shots for the first two weeks of the, of the program were filled on February 23rd, the first day of online registration, the government said. Cross-border workers such as flight crew and logistics personnel, staffers at residential care homes for the elderly and the disabled, and people over 60 years old are being given priority. In the Taiwan news, China to ban Taiwan pineapple starting March 1st. China blames harmful organisms and it comes at a bad time. Pineapple season in South Taiwan's Pingtung 
Kaohsiung, and Tainan is readying 10% of the total harvest for exports. China is the biggest consumer of Taiwan's pineapples, with sales to the country accounting for 90% of total export volume. There had been no prior warning of China's customs ban. Meanwhile, Japan remains a major buyer of Taiwanese pineapples. In ABC News Australia, farmers say fall armyworm, the coronavirus of agriculture, could force up food prices. It was first detected at Barnaga at the tip of far north Queensland. The hungry caterpillar, native to the Americas, is now devouring crops throughout Queensland and has invaded farms and plantations in the Northern Territory, Western Australia, New South Wales, and Victoria. Entire corn crops have been destroyed, and experts say the pest is now turning its attention to other crops, including peanuts and avocados. That's Around the Rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. In the Oregonian, judge dismisses transgender woman's suit against Miss United States of America pageant. And the winner is Miss United States of America. A federal judge threw out a lawsuit by a transgender woman who accused the private pageant corporation of discrimination for denying her the right to participate in competitions. U.S. District Judge Michael Mossman found that the Pageant Association cannot be required to allow a transgender woman to participate in light of its mission to promote, quote, natural-born females. Anita Noel Green of Clackamas, the 2019 Miss Earth Elite Oregon, was disappointed but satisfied that the lawsuit drew attention to an important bias issue. A lawyer for the pageant said it was not anti-transgender. In the Seattle Times, Seattle is texting alerts about leftover COVID-19 vaccines, Here's who can get on the limited standby list. At around 4.30 p.m. each day, the city says it will send out an alert Seattle message to some or all individuals on the standby list for people 65 and older, notifying them of unused doses. Those eligible will have to meet the vaccination team at a location within 30 minutes of being notified. The fire department's mobile vaccination teams sometimes have one or two doses left after holding daily vaccination events, for Seattle's most vulnerable people, and the doses must be used immediately. In Czech news, Victoria Mayor decries vandalism spree, head removed from Queen Elizabeth's second bust. Mayor Lisa Helps says that defacing public property is completely unacceptable, as the city works to learn more about the vandalism. The city confirmed the missing head on the same day that multiple messages involving Beacon Hill Park were discovered spray-painted throughout Victoria. Victoria Police Chief Del Manick said they are investigating. The statue, now surrounded by shrubbery, was erected in commemoration of the royal visit back in 1959. And these headlines in the Breaker.News. Site C sticker shock. Price tag hits $16 billion. Completion delayed to 2025. Coughing epidemiologist and fellow health board bigwigs flouted their own mask mandate. And Auditor General slams Trudeau Liberals, Vancouver Shipyards, for shipbuilding delays. Read the stories behind the headlines at the Breaker.News. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. Three Fraser Valley Evangelical Christian churches are going to B.C. Supreme Court this week to argue the B.C. NDP government's coronavirus pandemic measures that ban church services infringe upon the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Late last week, Dr. Bonnie Henry agreed to allow them to hold services outdoors. She also relaxed rules for a Victoria synagogue which prohibits its members from using electronic devices on the Sabbath. On December 14th, Premier John Horgan, Dr. Bonnie Henry, Health Minister Adrian Dix, and Consultant Robert Dom held a teleconference with leaders from BC's religious community. The Breaker.News obtained the recording via Freedom of Information. You can subscribe to the Breaker.News newsletter to get the link to the entire hour-long presentation. Following our highlights from the teleconference, you'll hear several leaders from across the spectrum unhappy with the public health orders that were imposed for the second wave of the pandemic. You'll also hear Dr. Bonnie Henry and Premier Horgan's answers. First, Reverend Rob Thiessen of the Mennonite Brethren of BC. So our question again is, like, could we not try to help those communities where you have seen some infraction, if that happened at a particular gathering, that an enforcement officer would help that group follow the guidelines because honestly as we get together as faith leaders 
we just don't, in our experience, none of us can, can say, oh, yes, there's been an outbreak, outbreak because of our church gatherings. So, uh, you know, it feels like that, uh, you know, this general sort of um, yeah, blanket approach is m maybe costing people uh, in maybe unseen ways, uh, increase in suicide, depression, loneliness. Ukrainian Orthodox Church Father Chad Polishin from the Okanagan Parochial District. One of the big difficulties with the the restrictions, the guidelines that uh, have been put in is, for us, is most of our parishioners, or my parishioners, between Kamloops, Cologne, and Vernon, in the, the parishes I serve, have, are seniors. They They still independently live, majority of them. Um, and technology is difficult. I'm live streaming my services, but they can't get them because they don't have internet or they don't manage their TVs beyond the channels. Um, you know, they want to, they are used to donating when they come to the church. So donations, of course, are down. Rabbi Rosenblatt from Congregation in Sharazadek. I was just wondering, I was recently in Montreal. And in Montreal, they have a 25-person limit on their services. My colleagues in Toronto tell me that there is a 10-person limit on services. And I was thinking perhaps British Columbia would be able to copy those models um, specifically, since it seems like those have been safe and proven effective in mitigating transmission in those locations. Rabbi Kaplan from Chabad of Vancouver Island. We have a religious belief of the importance of saving lives, and we take it no less seriously than anyone else. We have been, like I said, above and beyond what the requirements of the government were. But at the same time, religious services are important to people. They are essential, like I said, no less than going to a restaurant or a bar. And I think there must be there, there must be a way to balance between the, uh, making sure there's no health risk or reducing the health risk to the minimum. At the same time, allowing some kind of religious gathering, especially when we don't know for how long this order is going to continue. Dr. Bonnie Henry. What we were starting to see was transmission events happening. We've seen it in um, churches, in temples, in gurdwaras, in. Um, in a variety of different places, and that's why we took the measures that we did. I don't believe these will need to be in place forever. They are temporary measures, given the transmission rates we are seeing in our communities right now. Premier John Horgan. From our perspective, as both Dr. Henry and Adrian have said, uh, what we see is 600 British Columbians who are no longer with us, uh, and we see uh, thousands of cases of COVID-19, and it's not it's not malice by any individual or group, it's a virus. And uh, we're doing our best to uh, uh, be responsive to the needs of the community at the same time that we're doing what we're obliged to do, which is protect the public health of British Columbians. And, and it is a balance and sometimes we don't get it right. Dr. Bonnie Henry. We can agree, I hope, that um, religious services are qualitatively different than going shopping and picking up groceries at a grocery store or picking up your you know, toilet paper at, at Costco, where you're moving in and out. You're not actually congregating with people. Um, you're wearing masks, you're taking your, keeping your distances. Movie theaters are closed. All of those are closed. We do allow for people in the same household to eat at restaurants together, and we know that uh, they have specific measures in place, but we also know that that's a place where many people um, rely on uh, for having a meal. Premier John Horgan. Going forward, as, as Dr. Henry said, everyone uh, views things differently, and whether they be uh, officers, bylaw officers, or uh, citizens uh, who uh, believe that they uh, they want to see a more rigid interpretation of, of health orders. So it's a challenge for all of us, and uh, thank goodness uh, we have the opportunity to have these dialogues to cl clear the air and clarify points. Dr. Bonnie Henry. By April, it will start to uh, to have reached that point where it's going away. Those were highlights from a December 14th, 2020 teleconference with leaders from BC's religious community.
This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. We are nearing the first anniversary of the declaration of the coronavirus pandemic by the World Health Organization and the BC government's state of emergency. We are also early on in what I call Operation Slowpoke, BC's vaccination program that needs to hurry up fast if we're going to reach herd immunity by fall. Last week, there had been as many shots given in Washington state as all of Canada. Joining me is Mario Canseco, a friend of the podcast. He's the president of Research Co. To talk about his latest poll, which found two-thirds of respondents will not attend a concert or a sporting event until they get vaccinated. They're also staying away from restaurants, libraries, gyms, and rapid transit. It's harmful to the economy. The vaccines can't come fast enough. Are, are you surprised by the response to your survey? Well, I think the one thing that was quite surprising was that the appetite for reopening things fairly quickly is not there. Uh, We're at actually a higher level when doing things slowly than what we saw back in May of 2020. And back in May of 2020, we had significantly fewer cases. Uh, We still had to wait a long time for the vaccines to happen. Uh, There was no hope that this was going to be resolved fairly quickly. And we continue to see British Columbians who believe that we shouldn't be reopening everything. You know, this is coming in the context of what is happening in Ontario, where the pressure to reopen economic activity has been remarkably high. And it's one of the reasons for them to have decided to just go with it, albeit in a specific way, depending on the region where you live. Um, It's definitely problematic for economic sectors, because even if you had to uh, see a situation where the government were to say tomorrow, we're reopening everything and it's fine, you still have more than half of people who won't go to a gym, two-thirds who won't go to a concert, two-thirds who won't go to a sporting event. So it's a two-pronged campaign in my view. First of all, making sure that everybody who wants to get vaccinated can do so uh, within the next few months, but also talking about specific ways in which you can continue to enjoy your economic activity without having necessarily to go back to the way things were in February. You know, we still see one third of British Columbians who say, I'm not going out for dinner at all. It doesn't matter how much you clean the restaurant or whether there's a specific capacity that has to be met. Um, And I think that's been one of the messages that has been sorely lacking. You know, we've had a lot of discussions about how to save specific sectors, uh, but some of the groups that are responsible for those sectors aren't really talking a lot about how the average British Colombian can go back to the restaurant. The average British Colombian can start doing different things like going back to the library. So it's quite complicated because it's a combination of um, factors inside our heads. I haven't been vaccinated and I don't trust anybody else to handle anything until I am vaccinated. And obviously that places a, a higher level of responsibility within the federal government, which has established that deadline of September to have everybody with the shot. There is also a level of tension because churches, synagogues, and temples remain closed for worship, but big box stores and bars remain open. Yes, we saw that uh, the level of support for having some sort of exemption for churches is not particularly high. And one thing that we wanted to do was to measure this by religious affiliation. And, you know, people who are Catholic, uh, people who are Protestant, people who are Christian, they're more likely to say that they don't think it's the right time to reopen the churches uh, than those who don't profess any religion. So it's um, quite interesting in that sense, because people are erring on the side of caution. You know, there might be a lot of things that we can't do right now because of the pandemic. And they seem to look at religion as one of them. You know, maybe I can go to my kid's uh, soccer game or I can go to a concert or I can go to a restaurant uh, to watch the Super Bowl because we don't want to have the same situation that we had before. Um, I think what we see here is a scenario where most residents believe, well, if everybody's going to sacrifice, then they should sacrifice as well. But what we're seeing, especially the message coming out of some people who are dissatisfied with this is, no, we are special because, you know, this is the way in which we want to do things. Uh, Again, it's complicated because it's easy to look at this as a scenario where uh, somebody is going to decide to do something or certain activities might be seen as more harmful than others. Um, But it's it's a delicate balance and it's not one where public opinion is siding uh, with the churches that are bringing up these cases. So it's going to be complex for the government to maneuver this. Um, And it's an interesting challenge uh, in the way in which the government wants to establish a relationship with churches. You know, we do remember that case of the Jehovah Witness uh, blood transfusion under Gordon Campbell that was handled in a way uh, that was definitely better, uh, particularly because, you know, it wasn't something that alienated the base. It wasn't something that made everybody upset. 
um, we need a decision that is similar to that one if we want to continue with this and not have this case dragging on. In Ottawa last week, the Trudeau Liberal cabinet sat out, but 266 MPs from all parties voted unanimously to declare that China is committing genocide against Uyghur Muslims and to call on the IOC to move the Beijing Olympics. The Trudeau cabinet didn't put its partisanship aside. What do you think that might do to Justin Trudeau, the foreign policy, uh, as well as just attitudes towards Trudeau, especially if there is an election coming up this year? Well, we've seen every six months that the views of Canadians on China drop. Uh, we've been tracking this for the past couple of years. It's not a situation where residents are suddenly becoming more welcoming of China. We've seen a, a lot of animosity towards the idea of Huawei participating in the 5G spectrum. So you're not going to anger a lot of people if you decide to vote on something like this out of conscience. Uh, if anything, it creates a larger problem for the government because the story gets reported internationally as a unanimous vote from members of parliament in Canada related to this particular issue. Uh, of course, somebody who isn't really following Canadian politics well or understands the type of situation that this entails will make the assumption that this is something that was actually done by the government and something that was fostered by Justin Trudeau when in reality that's not the case. So you end up in a situation that is confusing for the international community. You don't please anybody by deciding to abstain on something like this, uh, particularly because of the situations with the two Michaels. So there's, no really, there's not anything to gain uh, from deciding that, you abst that you're not going to vote and yet you're asking your own cabinet not to vote on something like this. So, is not even something that is politically advantageous. You know, it's the kind of thing that can get thrown in their faces when the campaign happens, if the campaign happens this year, and especially if we don't have a resolution to the two Michaels. So it would have been fairly simple to just go out there and say, we believe that this is the case and we believe that this is something that is happening. Um, but they decided to pretend like it never even happened. And that is not something that voters, especially those who care about human rights, are going to be happy with. Here in BC to end the week, the most expensive take out the trash Friday announcement in BC history. Site C Dam is now going to cost $16 billion. It was also the 10th anniversary of Christy Clark becoming Premier. Do you think that the public is going to buy this long term, that uh, this is just another collateral damage from the pandemic harming the economy and harming this uh, mega project, the biggest mega project in BC history? Well, I think part of the problem here is that there's no constituency that gets affected from an electoral standpoint if they decide to pull the plug on this. Uh, it's not going to necessarily bring the environmentalists who voted for the Green Party and not the NDP back into the NDP fold. It's not going to be something that is going to convince a lot of BC Liberals uh, who still voted for the BC Liberals in 2020 to look at the NDP in a different light. So uh, it's essentially moving the goalposts in a way, um, but still managing a way to criticize those who came before them. So it's uh, definitely a dangerous game because when you're talking about billions of dollars, and we saw the situation that happened in Newfoundland just a couple of years ago. It's the kind of thing that can definitely hurt governments. And it's not something that gets dealt with easily. If you just come in there and say, well, that was my predecessor. This is something that I didn't have anything to do with, especially when now you have a couple of times when you've said, we're going to push through and it's going to cause this. And then you had to issue another press release and another conference where you say that it's going to be more, ex more expensive than it was. So, it's a way to try to maintain uh, the wing of the party that is interested in job creation uh, while not necessarily alienating those who will care about environmental concerns. If this was the definitive issue that people are going to be voting for, the Greens would have a majority in the legislature and that's just not the case. You know, there's a group that cares a lot about this and have been covering extensively, um, but it's not a top of mind issue with most British Columbians. Now, that being said, if the number starts to climb closer to 20 billion, which is what we saw right now, people are gonna start paying attention and it's going to be much tougher for the government to say, we had to do this because it was too big to fail. Uh, we saw what that did to specific uh, institutions and entities in the United States after the global financial crisis. And now years later, people aren't particularly happy with the fact that certain uh, institutions and entities were too big to fail. 
are, are they just doomed to fail on this project uh, and doing whatever they can to try to insulate themselves from any more criticism? Well, if they continue to do this on, a, on an annual basis, if we have a situation where the announcement is going to take longer or the actual um, moment in which uh, Site C becomes operational it goes further down the road, it could be part of this. It could be part of a strategy to just wait it out and make sure that it's not something that is um, electorally uh, negative for them. Uh, of course, you know, this is an issue uh, that has always been discussed within the boundaries of uh, efficiency on one hand, but also transparency. And what one would hope from something like this, especially after all of the revisions that we've had over the past couple of years, would be for a much more open and transparent approach to the communications that are there, to the way in which this relates to BC Hydro, to the cost of the taxpayer. And because of the track record of the person who has been appointed for this, uh, it just doesn't seem like that is going to be uh, the way in which things are going to flow when it comes to Site C. So if they were looking for a way to um, mitigate the criticism that is coming towards this project from those who don't see it as economically viable and less than transparent, this is not the one thing that you do in order to assuage those concerns. Well, thanks again to Mario Canseco, president of Research Co. for joining us on the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast to look at uh, provincial and federal politics and trends among the public as the coronavirus pandemic wears on, even though we do have the vaccine program off in the distance uh, here in Canada. This uh, light at the end of the tunnel, we're told, but it can't come soon enough. Thanks again to Mario. We're all in this together. Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to Search and Rescue Volunteers in advance of the BC Search and Rescue Volunteer Memorial Day on March 2nd. Thank you for your service. You're the unsung heroes of BC's emergency services team. You can nominate someone for a virtual Nanaimo bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting, custom homes and renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of February 28th, 2021. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on February 28th in 1983, the last episode of the TV series MASH, it drew almost 106 million viewers, still the biggest audience for a season finale on TV. Now you know. Send me your feedback. Send me your story ideas to bob at thebreaker.news. Bookmark thebreaker.news. You can also find us at thebreaker.ca. Sign up for the email newsletter and get updates to your inbox. For news as it happens, follow The Breaker News on Twitter and visit TheBreaker.News on Facebook. You can support The Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to Patreon.com slash TheBreakerNews. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash TheBreakerNews. Until next week. 